caring for patients with increased intracranial pressure. What is intracranial pressure? Intracranial pressure is the overall pressure within the human skull which can be influenced by several factors such as blood volume, cerebral spinal fluid and brain tissue mass. The normal range of intracranial pressure is between 5 and 15 millimeters of mercury and remains constant despite the small increase in blood volume. Cerebral perfusion pressure depends on the mean systemic arterial pressure and intracranial pressure through the following equation, CPP, is equal to the amount of MAP, subtracted by the amount of ICP. The mean systemic arterial pressure, is the sum of one-third of systolic blood pressure, and two-thirds of diastolic blood pressure. Cerebral perfusion pressure is maintained between 50 to 150 millimeters of mercury, through order regulation which can constrict or dilate blood vessels to maintain a stable blood flow to the brain. Cerebral perfusion pressure can fluctuate due to changes within intracranial pressure, a decrease in blood pressure or a combination of both factors. Small increases in brain volume do not lead to immediate increases in intracranial pressure because of the ability of the cerebral spinal fluid to be displaced into the spinal canal. However, once the intracranial pressure has reached around 25 mm of mercury, a small increase in brain volume can lead to marked elevations in intracranial pressure. However when there is a significant change in the blood volume which is greater than 100 to 120 ml, the intracranial pressure will rise rapidly. The causes of increased intracranial pressure Many conditions can cause an increase in intracranial pressure such as hemorrhages, strokes, brain tumors, encephalitis, head injuries, hydrocephalus, meningitis, subdural hematoma and status, epilepticus. The assessment of neurologically injured patients. The initial assessment of neurologically injured patients begins Firstly, with the assessment of the ABCs, which stands for airway, breathing, and circulation. The assessment is then followed with the Glasgow Coma Scale score. Assessment of cranial nerve functions. Assessment of the signs and symptoms of increased intracranial pressure. Temperature readings and then the cardiorespiratory assessment. Astute observations of any abnormal respiratory patterns is crucial, since this may be the first vital sign of change, indicating neurological dysfunction. Cushing's triad consists of irregular respiration, bradycardia and systolic hypertension. It occurs when there is cerebral ischemia causing peripheral vasoconstriction which leads to increased systolic blood pressure to improve cerebral perfusion. Cardiac Baro receptors sense this increased blood pressure, resulting in a vagal response, manifested as bradycardia. Abnormal or irregular respirations are the final component of Cushing's triad and occur due to brain stem compression. Early signs of increased intracranial pressure Headaches, lethargy, irritability, pupil dysfunction, change in level of consciousness, neurological symptoms such as weakness, numbness, eye movement problems, and double vision, seizures, vomiting, decreased spontaneous movement, pupil edema, pupil dilation with decrease or no response to light, increased blood pressure and increased respiration. Caring for patients with increased intracranial pressure. Nursing interventions can positively or negatively affect intracranial pressure. Nurses have a unique opportunity to manage patient care in order to decrease elevated intracranial pressure and prevent secondary brain injury. The goal of a nurse in this case is to maintain intracranial pressure at less than 20 to 25 millimeters of mercury. Maintain cerebral perfusion pressure at greater than 60 mm of mercury by maintaining adequate mean systemic arterial pressure levels. How to achieve this goal? 
This goal can be achieved by avoiding factors that aggravate, or precipitate, elevated intracranial pressure. Initiate nursing consults for skin management and hygiene, as indicated by the patient's condition. Maintain head of bed elevation of 30 degrees, based on patient's underlying disease process, to help control intracranial pressure, and assist in prevention of ventilator-associated pneumonia. Optimal respiratory management, is crucial for control of intracranial pressure. Adequate oxygenation is necessary, to prevent a sequel of secondary insult, and should be maintained with less than 60 mm of mercury, of partial arterial oxygen pressure, and an oxygen saturation of less than 90%. Sedating, and analgesia. Agitation, and pain may significantly increase blood pressure, and intracranial pressure. Adequate sedation and analgesia is an important adjunct treatment. Regulating the patient's temperature. It is important to maintain body temperature within the normal range of 35.5 degrees, and 37 degrees, to prevent hypothermia, and hyperthermia. Maintain blood pressure within the normal range of 80, to 120 millimeters of mercury. When pressure autoregulation is impaired, which is common after traumatic brain injury, systemic hypertension may increase cerebral blood flow and intracranial pressure. In addition, elevated blood pressure may exacerbate cerebral edema and increase the risk of postoperative intracranial hemorrhage. This is an assessment by Julia Wen. Thank you for watching.